Today's session is one of our art focused meditation sessions from the Freer and Sackler. It will be led by Aparna Sadananda. And we have as a special guest today, Masume Farhad, who is chief curator at the Freer and Sackler and a specialist in art of the Islamic world. And she is going to be introducing us um, at the beginning of the program to our focus artwork today. And then we will have more time at the end for some um, question and answer with Masme. Um, Masme, are you here? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so I will um, we'll share um, the artwork and we'll pass it over to Masme to begin. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you um, at the end of December. And I wanted to introduce you to a wonderful object uh, in the fair, which is actually on view in our galleries. And it's a, um, I think it's a fitting object um, for the end of the year. And it's, it's um, an intriguing one. So um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk to you about it. Um, you can see it's a beautifully decorated uh, round spherical object that recalls um, a planet, the universe, the earth, whatever you'd like to uh, imagine it to be. Um, it's not very big, sort of fits into your um, the palm of your both hands and um, it really does uh, invite um, sort of touching. It's, it's got this sort of wonderful tactile um, quality to it. Um, before speaking about its role and function, I um, would like to tell you a little bit about um, the decoration that you see um, on the surface and actually also about what it's made of. Um, it is, there's a gold sheen to it, but actually it's a little deceiving because it's not gold, but actually it's brass. So the object itself is made out of brass, but the decoration, the inlay that, that you see the patterns on it is done in uh, silver. And this is a technique called the inlay um, technique that flourished um, in the Islamic world as early as the 12th century in the Eastern Islamic lands, and then moved um, westward. And this particular object was created in the 14th century. So um, two centuries after this technique was developed um, in either Syria or in Egypt. And um, artists, you can, you, can, you can tell by the intricate design um, that you find uh, on this sphere, artists took great um, uh, pain to really cut little strips of silver. And then what they would do, and then they would inlay them into the surface of this work to create different kinds of patterns. Here you see in the sort of, in the larger bands that circle the sphere, you see sort of floral or, or, or patterns that imitate a star. And they all carefully interlinked. They all sort of seem to be hanging for, from a rope at the, at the top and also attached to what looks like a rope at the bottom. And then they're also interlinked um, to each other. It may be a little bit difficult to see um, on this slide, but I um, do urge you once the museum opens um, for you to come and um, see this object. And then um, sort of in the, in the middle of the, in the center of the sphere, you have two bands um, that are of a different pattern. They're sort of a meandering um, um, sort of vine motif with leaves. And what, um, what this particular design does, it sort of creates a sense of dance. It's as if these leaves are sort of dancing around this object, just as the way that the stars that you see right um, above and below create a different um, sense of movement. And that's what makes um, these metal objects created in the Islamic world so 
different and so special is that, that the designs are taken to really create um, a sense of animation. And by using silver on top of brass, and sometimes there was also gold used um, for decoration, it's as if the artist is painting with metals. It's a, it's a different kind of technique. And um, again, one that was um, very popular in the medieval um, Islamic world. Now, um, what, what is the function of this, uh, of this object? So what you see, um, actually right on your screen is a, is a, is a little knob um, and, and this sort of rim. Uh, and this tells you that actually, um, this is a little button that if you push, the, the sphere sort of opens into two halves. So um, it is something that opens up and has um, a mysterious inside um, or interior to it. And what you see inside is um, a little cup, you can see it in the center, that is held in place by a series of discs or gimlets. And this tells us exactly what this object was meant for. Because in that little cup, you would have originally put some incense, some hot coal and some incense. And what those discs or gimlets would do is to make sure that no matter in what position the sphere was, if it was like rolling around or whatever, that that little cup would always stand up straight, that it would not spill over. And um, very much like the, um, like our spirits that, you know, no matter what, what adversities we are um, experiences, the whole idea is for us to, to remain centered. And that is really the role of this little um, cup that you, you see in the center of this, um, of this object. So originally, this object was made as an incense burner. And also in this um, image, you can see the little perforations, the little holes on the outside. So that is where the incense and the smoke would have escaped and filled a particular uh, space at a particular um, ceremony. So the object is not only animated by the design um, that covers it, but it also becomes animated by the, the, the wonderfully sort of um, uh, scented incense that escapes uh, from its very center. So this is the original uh, function of this object, but it also has an interesting story because many of these objects were exported to Europe, were exported uh, in particular to um, to Italy, but also to the rest of Europe. And here, the weather and the winters were um, far more colder and harsher than the weather in Egypt or Syria. So in Europe, these particular objects were used as hand warmers, and many of them were um, acquired by the clergy who used to give uh, sermons in cold churches and needed to keep their hands warm. So um, this particular object um, or these types of objects are also known as hand warmers. So they're either incense, they're originally made as incense burners, but then they were also used um, as hand warmers in, uh, in Europe. And in fact, in Italy, um, Italian craftsmen had imitated this particular objects, and then they would only create them as hand warmers and not as incense burners. But of course you can use them um, for both functions. So um, in some ways, as we're all going to meditate, um, I think this object is a very good example um, to show how just as humans need to change and adapt and be flexible, so do works of art. And this is a prime example of one such work. So thank you very much. 
and I'd be happy to answer you um, any questions that you may have at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Masume, for taking us onto this intellectual journey through time and to Egypt and Syria. And uh, I hope all of you have enjoyed uh, this way of uh, experiencing this beautiful art object. And now I would like to take you on a journey where we explore it in a more direct way. Like one way of understanding this world and synthesizing a worldview is through knowledge and facts. But we could also create a connection to the art object by being more centered in the self and then looking at the object and, and just having a chance to witness how the mind and the body are responding to the work of art. So let's prepare for our meditation by finding a comfortable seated position. And if you wish to prop up your back with some pillows, just, just take your time to do that so we can all settle down. And for those who would like to explore this on their own, who probably would we will not want to be guided in the meditation, you are always welcome to click on the link that Grace shared a few minutes ago, where you can find all the information about the object and just be on your own and have your own meditation experience that way. But if you'd like to come along with my guidance, let's go together. So let's start by sitting comfortably and then taking our first look in many ways just like we're glancing at this object and you can imagine yourselves to be in a museum where this art object is on display and imagine you're walking into the room and then this spherical work of art captures your attention and you walk towards it Now, you could start by just noticing the shape of this object, the spherical shape. Like you're tracing it with your gaze. And noticing how the negative space behind it is highlighting this hand warmer or the incense burner. You notice how light is bouncing off the different parts of this object. As if the object is changing the way light comes to your eyes. I notice the shadow it casts. And notice the arrangement of the ornamentation in registers or like discs. And if you were to start from the middle, the center, you might be able to notice the symmetric arrangement of these registers and the details that are present in that. And now we'll start zooming in and examining the object closely from the top. Let's take some time to visually enjoy the beauty of these Kufic knots on top. Noticing the interlocking nature of these motifs.
And then slowly coming down to this third register from the top. If you could consider that as the third register here where the cursor is. Feel free to choose one of those medallions that you'd like to focus upon. And pay more attention to the details, to the shapes. If you wish to, you may start by focusing from the central dot right there. And notice the arrangement, the petals. the way they curve, like two worlds of petals superimposed. Notice how the pattern then radiates out to this outermost layer. where you can see that four of those patterns, like four of the outermost petals, for example, seem to be identical. Then on the top and the bottom are these rings connecting them to the periphery of that register. And then on the left and the right, fluid lines connecting this medallion to the next one. Notice the medallion flanked by these two patterns here. And when we just shift our attention away from the very captivating medallion, we might notice these arabesque patterns, like foliage in between. The tiny breaks in the form of these piercings. So now focusing on this medallion, which is looking quite like a star pattern. Let's take a moment to maybe look away from it or gaze down. Or if you'd like to, you can continue looking at it, but try to bring your attention to the body. Noticing the body's presence in space. Noticing where the body makes contact with that which it is resting upon. And slowly, we'll let that awareness expand to the rest of the body. Noticing our presence in the context of the space we're meditating from. And if all of this process of paying attention seems to take your breath away, let's take a few deep breaths together, inhaling through the nose, exhaling through the mouth, and breathing in through the nose, breathing out through the mouth.
And then you could further evolve your breathing to practice the retention of breath after you inhale. Breathing in all the way down. Maybe pausing the breath, just allowing the body to stay expanded in response to that inhale. And when it's time to release and let go, exhaling it up. Then we'll do a quick check-in as to what's going on in each part of the body feet, noticing sensations in the feet, the legs, hips in the seat, lower back, upper back, the shoulders and the chest, the waist, The arms, the hands, the neck, the face, and the head. Bring awareness to the entire body. Maybe noticing all of the sensations in the body at once. Like the outline of the body, the body wall is just one layer of our being. It's enclosing the energy of the breath, which is energy of life itself. And through that, the experience of having other layers like thoughts, emotions, feelings, like all of this is arranged in concentric circles around that center of our being, that which is witnessing all of this. So if you wish to, can we take a few moments just experiencing ourselves, maybe in these individual levels of the body, breath, emotions, sensations, thoughts, or maybe all of these layers at once surrounding the innermost component, which is a witness to all of these. Notice in this awareness of all these different layers of our being, how there is a mirroring of the self and the construction of this hand warmer. The very essence right at the center. Always saying, staying constant. No matter how the other layers, the all, concent all the concentric rings around it, you know, no matter how much they dangle, the center remains constant. 
just like the witness within resting in a peaceful state of balance and equilibrium, even though the outer layers may constantly change. If you wish to, you may visualize that very essence of your being as a flame of light. A seer who cannot be seen, who without him, without whom seeing cannot happen, as the Yoga Sutras say. Let's visualize that observer, that witness within in the form of light. And you may imagine that light diffusing out, just like the fragrance of the incense from this hand warmer. The radiance of that light permeates through these different layers of thoughts, emotions, sensations, all the way to the body. So just for a few moments, we're really centered in the wholeness of our being. is visualize ourselves as embodiments of light, like a star. And this light nurtured by the life-giving energy in each breath. So as we breathe in, we could imagine this light shining brighter and this light softening as we breathe out. Our whole being shimmering like a star. Now, if your eyes were closed, feel free to open your eyes and center your attention in that dot in the center of the star like medallion. And in that experience of feeling the star-like quality within feels complete, notice the interlocking patterns connecting the star to the other stars. Now if we imagine each one of us here to be like these medallions, then this intention to come together time and again, to share this sense of community, it's quite like the interlocking patterns connecting these medallions. Take a moment to also appreciate the same pattern symmetrically represented here in the lower half of the sphere. Noticing how the silver pieces seem to highlight this connection, the sense of togetherness. Like the very essence of our being in the center of the sphere, in the center of our being, is preserved by this connection to each other. 
and the tiny floral patterns here reminding us of the sweet fragrance of this connection as we navigated the challenging times of this year. If you wish to, you may close your eyes. Just imagine that you're holding this hand warmer between your palms. And even placing your palms as if there's the orb in between. Let's take a few breaths here. Feeling the warmth of this connection. Connection to the self deep within and connection to each other. And on each mindful breath here, let us silently repeat as we inhale, I am here now. And as we exhale, we're together. I'm here now. We're together. And placing these palms on the heart. Experiencing the heart warming sensation as we savor this connection. Take a moment to thank all the forces that facilitated our coming together here and now. Let us honor the self with a silent namaste. A silent namaste to the artisans whose skilled artistry gave us this beautiful and very inspiring work of art. Namaste to all the ancient yogi sages here, all the teachers of yoga for bearing the tradition of yoga and its wisdom through space and time. And finally, but most importantly, may we offer namaste to each other. Like we're saying, the light in me honors the light in you. And thank you all so, so much for sharing your presence and practice with me. Namaste. Thank you so much, yogis. I hope you enjoyed this meditation. And now I would like to pass over the screen to Grace again. And we'll continue the intellectual and mindful exploration of this work of art. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to post that to the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Thank you for taking us through that journey from the, the very micro to the macro scale, looking at the details of the stars. And I loved how Adrian noticed in the chat that when we saw the inside of the sphere, the little perforations look like stars or constellations as well. So also reminding us of the cosmos. That was beautiful. Um, we have some questions in the chat. So I wanted to um, ask some of those to Masame and hear a little bit more. Um, several people asked what, um, what incense was used? Was it actually burned inside this object? And then when, when it was a hand warmer, was there something else burned inside or how did it stay warm? Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think both of these questions are um, a very good questions. Um, our, our knowledge of some of the details are, are a little sketchy, um, but um, actual incense was used, so it was, um, the most common was myrrh and frankincense. And so basically what you would do is, you know, you would put some hot coal and then you would put the, um, the incense on it. So then it would sort of slowly burn and, um, and then sort of enter a space um, through those uh, perforations. Um, and when it was used as a hand warmer, it, they would 
probably just use coal because um, incense actually was extremely expensive. So you would not use it to just warm your hands. You would simply use coal. But again, our details are somewhat sketchy, um, our information about exactly what was used. But that is, um, that is the basic understanding how it was used in the um, Middle East and then in, in the West. We also had a few questions about the craftsmanship of the object mm -hmm. and the technique used to make it. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little more about that and um, how the silver was applied. And also Meredith asks, could the patterns be considered in the Damask, Damask scene style? Mm -hmm. um, yes, to that first um, uh, uh, question. I mean, this, th this type of work is really sort of the origin of the Damascene style. And, and as, as the work, as the word suggests, uh, it was something that um, flourished in Damascus. It was, it was not the place where it originated, but it certainly flourished there. And, and it continued, actually it continues to this day. So that is the origin. And, and the idea is that you would use different kinds of metal to decorate um, another type of metal. So um, that's sort of the basic um, explanation of the style. And in terms of how it was, it was done, the, um, so what, what you would do, you would, you would um, create a pattern. And again, um, one would assume that it was probably drawn out first and then transferred to some of these, um, some of these objects. And, and you can, if you, if you zoom in um, on the object, I don't know if we can, um, you can see these little ridges and around the ridges, both at the top and the bottom, you can see it's like slightly darker because you would roughen those edges and then you would push, you would cut the silver to exactly fit those ridges. And then you would sort of push it in and make sure that it adheres to the surface. So there was no glue or anything used. It was just sort of pushing the silver into um, into the brass. And because it wasn't um, adhered by any other, um, in any other way, um, as you can see, you would, it, you know, it has a tendency to fall out. And for instance, with the little petals, you can see some of them are still silver and the other ones are, you know, are brass because the silver has fallen out from those, um, from those areas. So that's how um, basically these designs were, were created. Just to follow up to that, um, what type of tools would have been used for this inlay work? Do you know? Um, tiny, tiny, tiny tools. Um, they, they, um, I mean, you, you would have very sharp um, tools to engrave the patterns and then roughen the surface again. Um, not much has survived from this period, but now um, actually watching and observing what craftsmen do now gives us a sense of how it was probably done in the past. So we sort of work backwards because this, you know, this tradition of inlaid metalwork has, again, has survived since the 12th century in the Islamic world. And it's with, with much of the art, um, and artistic tradition, it was passed on from one generation to the other. So there's real continuity in these in these um, in these crafts. And um, again, I mean, tiny, really um, uh, tiny and very precise um, uh, tools, you know, made out of metal in order to make the various make the various designs. That's so fascinating to hear about the continuity of the tradition. Um, Rebecca has a, another question. She asks, was there a ritual aspect to this object when it was originally created? Um, mm -hmm. How would it have been used? I guess, when was the incense burned? Mm -hmm. And then also did the Western adaptations of it as a hand warmer give credit to the object's origins? Did people know that this object came from the Middle East? Mm -hmm. 
Well, again, those those are those are wonderful um, questions. Um, incense played um, an extremely important role um, throughout the Islamic world, and actually even prior to that, prior to the arrival of Islam in um, the entire region, um, incense was very important, and uh, incense actually came from. Um, the uh, South Arabian Peninsula, what is now Yemen, and vast fortunes were spent on, um, on buying incense. In many ways, it was the oil of the ancient world. It really um, led to the creation of great civilization. Petra, for instance, um, was on the incense road. Um, so incense was extremely important. It was also extremely expensive. And, um, but when you read um, accounts and histories, um, you know that in order to give prominence and importance to any event, be it religious or be it secular, incense was part of that. And um, so while we don't exactly know in what context this object was used, um, but it was certainly for, it could have been for an important ceremony, it could have been private, it could have been public, it could be religious. Um, or it could be secular, but it, but incense really meant to mark uh, an important event, an important gathering where people would come together. Um, and, and did um, Westerners uh, know about the, um, did uh, give credit? Yes, the, um, actually already in the medieval period, um, works that were created in the Islamic world were extremely popular in the West. Um, you see paintings, you see Renaissance paintings with um, objects like this depicted. Um, you see carpets depicted um, in, in paintings. We know that the Medici family, for instance, um, in Italy collected um, Syrian and Egyptian medieval metalwork. And there in many of the paintings, again, you, you see different examples. These were objects of great luxury and of great importance. So if you wanted to show your wealth, you, you would include or you would acquire objects um, like this. This was the exotica for, um, for the West and it was a sign of wealth and sophistication. Thank you, thank you, that's fascinating. Can uh, we look at the inside of the object one more time? We had another uh, mm -hmm. person who just wanted to see the inside and they were wondering how the, how the pin works. I don't know if we can see that here. Um, well, it's, it's, uh, I'm not a scientist. It's, it's a, um, if you can see, it's, um, it actually looks like a planet, but it's um, attached to the signs of the, um, uh, of the inside of the sphere and the various discs, discs are interconnected. Um, so again, um, the, the, they, they're the, um, and it's, it's the sort of the interconnectedness that just keeps the balance um, of, um, of the central, uh, central cup. Yes. Um. Catherine notes this could also, this seems related to a gyroscope. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah. Another, another word for this mechanism. Yes. And actually the mechanism I, um, was, uh, was first, or at least it's found in earlier examples that, was, uh, that were made in China. So, um, and again, it shows the interconnectedness of the world. I mean, we think that um, it's only in the 20th and 21st century that we are in, interconnected, but many of these objects show that, you know, our, our um, ancestors were, were just as connected in different ways. So this idea of um, incense burners with this kind of um, sort of mechanism um, have been found in, um, in China. Then the idea moved to the Middle East where and there was a great deal of trade between China and the Islamic world. And then it also moved to, to the West. Well, I think that's a beautiful thought to end on. Thank you so much, Masame, for your time and for joining us today and telling us about this gorgeous object.
we'll definitely um, have you back in another session in the new year. And I want to thank everyone for your comments in, in the chat and how supportive you've been. I'm glad these sessions have been enjoyable and valuable this year, and we look forward to offering more and to hopefully welcoming you back safely to the museum soon in 2021. I'll uh, turn it over to Aparna to just say a few words to close us out. Thank you, Grace. And thank you, Masume, for really that uh, enlightening uh, spotlight talk. Uh, I think we couldn't have ended our meditations, our art-based meditations with a better work of art. This was so perfect. And thank you, Grace, for selecting that artwork. Um, we're really, really um, thankful to everyone who's been a part of this. Uh, you know, I would like to think of it as a meditation family that has built over the last several months. Thank you for being with us. And uh, as I wish you a very, very happy and joyous holiday time, very mindful holidays, um, I hope to meet you all again on January 4th. So please do come back on the Monday of the 4th of January, where we will start at a new time, which is 12 to 12.30, instead of the usual time of 12.15. So please do know that it's 12 to 12.30. And hope to see you next year. Take care. Namaste. Be mindful.